to speak in these uh, webinar series. And uh, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, have uh, start with a brief outline of the talk. So I'll start by uh, giving a very brief review uh, of results on free boundary problem with the local diffusion. That's what we started first. And then I'll just uh, briefly uh, discuss, uh, so what's the difference between local and non-local diffusion. So I assume that some of the audience tonight, or for me it's night tonight, but I don't know people in different places <laughs> might be different time of the day. So anyway, uh, because some of the audience uh, may not be an expert in this area, so I'll just uh, mention some uh, basic facts on the difference between local and non-local diffusion. And then I'll talk about uh, some recent model we worked on. It's a 1D free boundary model with non-local diffusion and then explain uh, some of the main results we obtained recently, and then compare the results between problem with the local diffusion and a problem with the non-local diffusion here. So now uh, let's start with this uh, brief review for uh, local diffusion problems. Now let's start with this uh, very classical one. So this is usually called the Fisher KPP equation, when the nonlinear function FU takes a special type, I'll mention in the next slide. So this is a, a very simple uh, parabolic equation in one space dimension. And this is basically a, a Cauchy problem. So we are given an initial function, we want to know uh, the behavior of the solution U. And it started with this uh, uh, kind of application as a motivation. So here, so when it started, uh, when Fisher used uh, this model, he used this U, the unknown function, to represent the population density of uh, some species that carry uh, good genes. And at a time t and uh, space location x. x now is simplified to be in just r1. And this initial function u0 represents the initial population. So naturally, uh, it's a non-negative function. And it because, so this model was proposed to describe the spatial spreading of the species. And so it's natural to assume Initially, the population concentrate on a bounded part of uh, the space, so this R. So in mathematics, we say it has uh, compact uh, support. And the growth function F of U, and usually uh, we assume it's a C1 function and F0 equals zero. So if we think of it as a reaction term, so when the population density is zero, or when the uh, density of a chemical species is zero, there's no reaction. So this is uh, pretty uh, natural. And so this term d u double x, so this represent the diffusion. So in the model, it's assumed that the individuals in the species, they move in space randomly. Now for this uh, nonlinear function, so Fisher just used this one, u times y minus u, this quadratic function, very simple. And so KPP stands for uh, Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, and Piskunov. In the same year, they also considered uh, this same uh, equation. And with a nonlinear function more general than this one, but behaving similarly. A striking feature of this equation one is the following. So you can prove there exists a constant C star positive, so that, so as T 
goes to infinity, the population, the density of the population is close to one in this set, in this region. So this is a region, well, in one space dimension, this is just an interval with the right end close to C star times T. And the left end at minus this. Outside of this interval, the population is close, close to zero. Now, considering the interval is uh, changing with the time. So in the right hand side, so the rate of a change is roughly C star. So because of that, uh, people use that, interpret this as seeing that the population spreads into new space with a speed C star. Now, of course, we want to know how to determine this C star. Well, this is determined by a traveling wave problem. So that was uh, how this uh, thing started with the Fisher and called a KPP. When you look for a special solution in that form for this equation here, with Fu, this particular form, and you can find, so here, so this C is a, a parameter. You look for a solution in that form, you change the partial different equation to an ODE. And because uh, you are looking for well, now we call it a traveling wave solutions. If you have a, such a solution, you say the solution is a traveling wave with a speed C. Well, you can show that for C greater than or equal to this C star, well, with Fu in this special form, you can calculate this star by this formula, two square root D. For C greater than or equal to this C star, you can find such a solution, but for C less than C star, you don't. So for that reason, C star is called the uh, minimal wave speed of traveling waves to this problem. Now, this earlier slide tells us that, well, this model tells us that, so the population spread with the speed C star, and this C star can be calculated in this way, two square root AD. So this uh, is a pretty uh, nice. So you use a very simple model, then it tells you a spreading speed, which is a very important notion in biology. Now, of course, this is not that perfect. And in many situations, you want to know, well, if uh, the population spread waves at the very front geometrically. Well, if we follow uh, the meaning of the solution, U is the population density, then the population range at time t, a little time, is given by this set. So all the x values in R such that U is a positive. So you change t, this set should change. Well, actually this set doesn't change because of the maximum principle, this set, once t is greater than zero, is always the entire R. Though you start with the initial function, initial population concentrated on a bounded set. Well, this does not uh, spoil the thing for application because we can nominate a small delta and consider this set. For any delta greater than zero, small, this set, we call it omega delta t, it depends on that. However, this time, no matter how small is t, as is delta for any positive t, this set omega delta is a finite set for any t positive. And then we can use these to approximate the population range. And then the boundary of this set can be regarded as the spreading front, geometrical front. And then using these rigorously proved result, uh, you can say this front, so you look at the rightmost point on the population range, now this is a setting R, and then you look at the leftmost point on the range. Well, they go to infinity as t goes to infinity at this speed, c star. So now this indeed gives 
a clear meaning for this uh, C stop. That's the spreading speed. You follow this front, you go to infinity when T goes to infinity at this speed, C star. Well, so uh, about 10 years ago, in the joint work with uh, Professor Zhi Guilin of Yangzhou University in China, we tried to uh, reformulate, modify the original classical model, this Cauchy problem, by incorporating these uh, exact front, geometric front in the spreading process. So we just use the same semilinear equation, semilinear parabolic equation, but we only assume it's a set of file over this changing interval. So now the right side and the left side of the interval change with the time. And at the boundary, so at the two end, that's what we try to represent as the geometric front of the spreading, the population density is zero. And outside, we assume there's no such population. And then we also put an initial function here. So initial population at t equals zero. And then, of course, mathematically, if you make the domain change, you have to tell how it changed. So now here, we borrowed this uh, so-called Stefan condition here. So this equation, together with u equals zero, determines how these two end evolve with the time. So now this two is a, a well-posed problem. So we can show uh, it has a unique solution. It's defined for all t. And then the, what's left is to analyze its long-term behavior. And would that, would that new modified model uh, give us a behavior that, rep, that mimic the spreading phenomena? Well, it turns out that indeed it is. So we can show, so for this problem two, uh, we have these properties. So this time we have a dichotomy for the long term behavior. So one possibility is the species spread successfully, we call it a spreading. So this moving interval, the population range, when T goes to infinity, goes to R. And the population density goes to one locally, uniformly in space. The other possibility is what we call vanishing. The species vanishes eventually. So the population range converts to a finite interval, and the population density converts to zero uniformly. So we can show actually both cases can happen. And the other result is about a spreading speed. So when we modify the model, and we still want to keep the good features of the original one, fortunately, we still have a spreading speed when spreading is successful. So we can show that when this happens, so the front, so now the front, the right front is at h of t, x equals h of t, left front is x equals g of t, the front of the population range. So these both goes to infinity, like c zero times t. Well, now we have a new positive constant. So I'll explain how to determine this constant in a moment. But now let me say, so we can determine uh, when these two cases happen exactly by using the mu as a parameter. The mu now appears here is in the Stefan condition. So what's the meaning of this Stefan condition in this context? Well, in these joint paper with uh, Dr. Bunting and Dr. Krakowski, and we, uh, we made an assumption, say, uh, if the species near the front has some loss, so there, there's a k units of loss per unit of volume out of the front, and then the mu would be d over k 
k. So these k unit, that's a lot. And d is the diffusion rate. So if we use this mu as a parameter, then we can show we have a, a threshold mu star positive so that, so spreading happens exactly when mu greater than mu is greater than mu star. Now let's come back to this speed C0. Now it depends on this prior to mu. And this C0, this C0 here, it depends on mu. It's also determined by an ODE. Basically, uh, similarly, we look for a terminal wave solution. We end up with these, uh, this problem. Now, because we have this Stefan condition, at zero, we have an extra condition. So this mu appears in the Stefan condition. So here we call it a semi-wave because it's defined on, a, on the, uh, the half real line. So in the original problem, so this C star is determined by the problem on the real line, full real line. So now it's on half real line. So we call this solution a semi-wave. And here it's not a minimal speed, it's the unique speed. You give me a mu positive, uh, I can show I have a unique C0. And C0 is related to the classical C star in, in that way. As mu goes to infinity, so this C0 would increase to this C star. Actually, this entire problem, these two and the classical one is related when you look at this uh, parameter mu, when mu goes to infinity, and the classical problem one actually can be viewed as the limiting problem of this new problem two. So we can show that, so if we now to stress the dependence on mu, we denote the solution of a two, the free boundary problem. Well, for that problem, u and both u and the interval omega t are unknowns. So they, if we mark them as u mu and omega mu to stress the dependence on mu, actually we can show when mu goes to infinity, so this goes to R and this solution goes to capital U. Capital U is the unique solution of one. Of course, we have to assume they have the same initial value. So therefore, so this one, the classical problem can be viewed as a limiting problem for two. If you let the prime to mu go to infinity, well, in, in that uh, interpretation, all k goes to zero. There's no loss near the boundary, then you go back to the classical model. Well, this is just a, a very brief account for uh, the very uh, simple, the most simple cases of one and two. And as we know, uh, so there are many, many uh, more advances on these models in multiple uh, directions. So now let me just mention that the result, uh, uh, the result for one I mentioned earlier is actually uh, from the paper by Aronson Weinberg. And the Result for two, the free boundary problem is uh, from the joint work, my joint work with the uh, Zhigui Lin of Yangzhou University and the Zhong Ming Guo of uh, Henan Normal University in China and also uh, with the uh, Bang Dong Lo of Shanghai Normal University in China. So there are many more results uh, uh, which have appeared since these earlier ones uh, in uh, many directions. However, uh, because today I want to uh, concentrate on non-local problems, I'll just escape these. And just to say so far for both one and two, so we used these uh, local diffusion or random diffusion to describe the spatial dispersal of the population. And which, as we know, is not ideal. There are, in, there are many situations, real situations, for which a non-local diffusion approximation would be better for the spatial dispersal. 
And of course, for the classical problem one, that's the problem without a free boundary. And uh, there have been uh, many, many uh, research on this non-local version of one. And for example, in the 10, last 10, 20 years, there are already many, many uh, deep works and there are still many work on that, in that direction. So it's a faster progress. But for the free boundary problem, it's uh, relatively new. So we have just started recently. Well, now uh, let me just uh, briefly uh, explain why the need to uh, locate a, a non-local diffusion instead of local diffusion. Well, one uh, reason is that in uh, many uh, practical situations, there's a so-called long-range dispersal, and that cannot be captured by using the random diffusion operator. So it's better to use a different one. And so now I'll just mention a particular one, but before I mention that one, uh, let me uh, explain uh, in uh, very simple terms in this one space dimension. Well, uh, why you say these U double derivative uh, represent local diffusion, random diffusion. Okay, now let's uh, try to understand this from the modeling point of view. So we discretize uh, space and time. So divide R1 into uh, small blocks or small intervals of equal length delta X and divide time uh, into steps of length delta T. And then random, random walk basically says an individual from the current time t to the next step t plus delta t. So it would move uh, from its current position x to either uh, the left neighboring block. So now remember we divided uh, r into equal intervals, infinite many equal length of the intervals. So now an individual at uh, one block would move from the current time to the next time step, either to the left neighboring block or the right neighboring block with the equal prob probability half. It has to move, it cannot uh, not move. It must move either to the left or to the right, but with the probability half to both. And if you uh, try to pass to the limit to get a continue, continuous a continuum model, and then you, this process would give you this term here, <laughs> in this modeling. So, uh, so you would arrive at this term here. So this random uh, movement of individuals would at the end uh, give you this. And this D uh, determines how fast you move. So this is the ratio between space and time. But uh, so anyone, uh, doing numerical analysis would know this not a linear, it's, uh, it's like this, delta x squared over to delta d converts to d, delta t converts to d. Anyway, so this is how uh, this local diffusion operator arrives. Now for non-local diffusion, uh, the, so we do the same kind of uh, division of R1 and the division of time into equal length of the blocks. However, this time you assume that an individual uh, from its current location X can jump in the next time, at the next time step to any other location Y, not only the neighboring block, can, can be anywhere, but with the probability given by a probability function J. So here you can make this more uh, general, it's a function of two variable, but usually, uh, so uh, in, this, uh, in this talk, I would just concentrate on this simpler kind of a probability function. Uh, it only depends on the distance between X and Y. So now if you uh, use this in the uh, modeling process, then instead of uh, this term, 
local diffusion term, you would arrive at this term. So this integration with this convolution kernel J. So this probability function J becomes a convolution kernel. So you can say, so, uh, so these, these times that integrate with, with Y for Y goes over R basically tells you uh, how many individuals uh, comes to from elsewhere to X. And then this minus this in integral tells you how many individuals moved away from X. So the difference would just tell you in the next time moment, how many individuals are, are at X. So that's how you uh, arrive at this. So then uh, the classical model one uh, would become that. Basically you just replace this local diffusion term with that term involving this uh, probability kernel. So everything else is the same. You have the same nonlinear function. You have the same initial function. It's just this, uh, this term for diffusion has changed from a local diffusion to what we call non-local diffusion. And the usual uh, kernel, uh, well, uh, there are many, many choices. So now basically uh, we are free to choose. So uh, in particular for uh, tonight's talk, I'll, I'll mostly concentrate on kernels of this type, continuous, non-negative, even, and normalized. And for these kernels to, well, of course, you change the kernel, uh, the dynamical behavior of three would change. And, but one class of a kernel is singled out. It's called a thin-tailed. So if there's a function, now we concentrate on continuous functions, non-negative, even normalized. If you have this property, so if it times a to some lambda x is integrable, because it's a symmetric, it's even just considered integration from zero to infinity. So if this is integral for some lambda, not every, just for some lambda, then we would call this thin tilled. Otherwise, we say the kernel is a fat tail. It turns out that for thin tilled kernels, and the dynamical behavior of three share many similar properties as the one for with the local diffusion one. Through uh, the work of many, many people, here I just mentioned a few uh, who started early, and there are now many, many uh, people working in this area. So one very uh, striking difference between three, the non-local model, and one, the local model, happens with the fat-tailed kernels. And in the, in the view of uh, spreading, and for these kind of kernels, accelerated spreading happens. So we still try to use three to explain. So now when I say three, I also mean we take FU, the feature of KPP1. So prototype is U times one minus U. For these kind of kernels, you, we look at a three and well, you can still show similar behavior. So you start with a similar kind of uh, initial function non-negative with a compact support not, not identically zero, then uh, the solution exists for all time and when t goes to infinity, uh, it converts to one locally uniformly in space. And then you want to know whether you have a spreading speed, uh, how does the spreading happen, and you do the similar thing, you use this level set, that's the boundary of these, uh, these nominated a population range with a small delta. You look at that, you look at the right most point on this set, the left most point, well, you find these go to infinity when t goes to infinity, but if j is a thin tailed, it has a finite speed. If j is a fat tailed, no, it's infinite speed. This infinite speed is something completely new. 
and it's called accelerated spreading. And for this Fisher KPP model, and this uh, threshold is determined by this condition, whether it's a thin tailed, determined by the kernel. And how, in this case, when it goes to infinity, the speed is infinite. And how fast can it go? So if we look at this, and we can show that, so depend. So if your kernel function at infinity behaves like x to the sigma, sigma less than minus two, and for that case, it's a fat tilt. And then, uh, so this would go to, uh, these would go to infinity faster than t, it's like e to the alpha t exponentially, alpha positive. But if jx behaves like that near infinity, that's a still fat tail, then it would grow like t to the beta, beta greater than one. So the beta comes from here. And also there are other kind of a kernels. For example, if you look at the fraction the Laplacian, then the kernel function would be like this. So here uh, I, I talk about n dimension. This capital N means n dimension. Well, this kernel is not continuous. It has a singularity at a zero. It is not normalized. Well, it's the, the integral is uh, infinity. Anyway, and you can still use it as a kernel and you understand the uh, convolution uh, in that way. And then, uh, so you replace, so you replace this term in one, the local diffusion by the fraction of diffusion, and you can show you have uh, accelerated the spreading. And actually, so you have, by the result of Cabrera and uh, Rob Joffrey, and they proved that. So, uh, so, so these uh, basically it says so. So in high dimension, if you do a similar thing, these goes to infinity like that. Okay, now so let's come back to the free boundary problem. So, so let's look at these uh, local diffusion one. So that's the one with the local diffusion. So now we want to do the similar thing. We replace this by the non-local diffusion term. Then we have We have this, so just to replace that term by this one. And everything else is the same. And again, at the end point of the population density, we assume it's zero, but, so the, the natural free boundary condition is no longer this different kind of a condition here. It's not these ones. And the natural one, is, uh, is the following. So we, we integrate, we use integrations involving the kernel function. So why these integrals? Well, if we follow the same kind of a, a biological assumption, so now diffusion has been changed to this non-local diffusion. So, so a similar kind of a reasoning would give you this. So now the initial function we assume is uh, continuous at the boundary of this initial interval is zero and the inside is positive. And for the kernel function, and uh, as I said, we assume it's continuous at zero is positive, normalized, even, and it's uh, bounded. So this is, uh, uh, in my talk today, this is uh, the standing assumption for the kernel. And for the nonlinear function, uh, we keep using the uh, Fisher KPP classical one, u times y minus u. So the meaning of the free boundary condition, so you look at this term, actually it tells you uh, the population that uh, went, uh, that passed across 
uh, this right boundary per unit time. So that's the population that's lost. And as in the local diffusion model, we assume so these uh, this movement of the free boundary is proportional. So the, the ratio of movement, the derivative of this is proportional to this quantity. And, and similarly from the population loss from the left uh, boundary is given by that quantity. So we assume that, so the movement, the change ratio of the boundary is proportional to this uh, lost quantity by some constant mu, well, mu over d, because we have a d here. Then we would arrive at that condition. So this uh, biological meaning is similar to the one with the local diffusion. And this free boundary condition actually was uh, used independently in these two papers, recent papers, both appeared last year. And so this is uh, uh, my joint work with uh, Jia Feng Cao from, uh, from Lanzhou and uh, Fang Li, uh, Dr. Fang Li from uh, uh, Guangzhou and Professor Wan Tong Li from Lanzhou University. And so uh, in two, they consider the case F is identically zero. So therefore the behavior is a uh, long time behavior is very different. So that one considered a, a nonlinearity uh, of this type. So, well, we basically can show uh, something parallel to the local diffusion model. So of course we have a existence a uniqueness, uh, we can prove it. Uh, and we also have a spread and vanishing dichotomy. So again, uh, when T goes to infinity, we have two possibilities either spreading successfully, so the population range uh, goes to R, the population density goes to one, and or vanishing. So population range converts to a finite interval, population density converts to zero. And also we can uh, determine exactly when spreading or when vanishing happens. So, so this is a complete classification. So no case is left. So we can uh, determine that. And of course, if you look at it here very carefully, you will observe some difference between this non-local model, non-local diffusion model and the local diffusion model. For example, there's no correspondent for this first case in the local diffusion model. But of course, so we want to check the spreading speed when spreading happens. And that's where we will see the striking difference. So about the spreading speed, and we also have a threshold condition on the kernel function. So for the classical non-local diffusion model without a free boundary, we know the thin tailed condition is the threshold one. Now, for non-local diffusion with free boundary, and this is the threshold condition. So Jx times x is integrable over the positive half axis. So our result, this is based on a recent joint work with Feng Li, that's the same Feng Li from Guangzhou, and uh, Dr. Maolin Zhou, uh, who worked in Australia uh, for uh, several years and has recently moved back to China uh, to Nankai University in Tianjin. And we proved that, well, if J1 holds, then we have a finite spreading speed. If J1 does not hold, then we have infinite spreading speed or accelerated spread. So, so we assume the standard assumption J, so the standing assumption here. And then on that standing assumption, so this J1 is the threshold condition to determine whether we have accelerated spread. So if this does not hold, then we have accelerated spread. 
Now, of course, there are now two questions we want to answer. When there's a linear spreading or finite spreading speed, we want to determine C0. And when it's accelerated spreading, we also want to say how fast these HT and GT go to infinity. First, let's determine this C0. And this C0 is determined by considering what we call semi-wave problem. This is uh, basically uh, the corresponding one for the local diffusion problem with the free boundary. So here we, again, you look for uh, terminal wave solutions in the non-local diffusion setting and you would arrive at these. And then the free boundary condition would uh, give you another condition. So now to determine this C0, we solve this uh, system five simultaneously. Now we can show on the condition J, this has a unique solution pair if and only if J1 holds. And when J1 holds, or we can determine a unique C0 positive and a unique phi zero, which is decreasing. And this C0 is, is this one. So we have to solve this uh, completely. Well, so again, now this J1 determines whether this has a solution. And then uh, we want to know whether we can uh, estimate this. So when J1 does not hold, can we estimate how fast HT goes to infinity? Now it's faster than linear. It's accelerated spreading. For this purpose, we look at a, a special type of kernel function. So we look at this kind of kernel function, which at infinity, it behaves like x to the minus alpha. Well, for these kind of kernels, let's check. So the standing assumption j means alpha has to be greater than one, because the j has to be integrable itself. So that's equivalent to alpha greater than one for this kind of j. And the j1 hold is equivalent to alpha greater than two. So if it, alpha is greater than one, but less than or equal to two, then j1 does not hold. Well, by this earlier result, it means we would have accelerated spreading. But for alpha greater than two, we have finite spreading speed here. Well, in this case, actually, we can estimate the difference of C0 minus HT. So if alpha is greater than three, well, of course, J1 holds, we can show this difference is bounded. So if we use that to mean this, so this is order one. But if alpha is a three, so this difference is no longer order one. This order is log t. If alpha is between three and two, so that's still in that range, we still have a finite spreading speed, C zero. But so ht, the difference now is t to the three minus, it's not bounded, though it's a lower order than t. We have these orders. Now for alpha less than or equal to two and greater than one, then we move to the range where J1 does not hold. We know now HT and GT goes to infinity faster than linear. Well, if alpha equals two, so from greater than, if it's two, then we know it's T times log T order. So in the remaining case between two and one, so cannot be below one or equals one. Otherwise J is not set far. This does not, it's not integrable anymore. So in that range, so this goes to infinity like T to that power. This power of course now is greater than one. So faster than linear, but in that order, exactly in that order. So, so for these kind of special kernels, so we know much more for the spreading speed.
So this is from a very recent joint work with uh, Dr. Wen Jie Ni, who is now uh, doing postdoc with me uh, in Australia. So now summarizing, so we found, so under the standing condition J, so look at model three, the classical model with non-local diffusion, but with no free boundary. Four, the modified model for three, non-local diffusion with the free boundary. So we know for this special feature KPP nonlinearity, accelerated spreading for three, the classical non-local diffusion model is equivalent to say, the kernel function does not set it for J thin. It's not a thin, thin tailed. And here for four with the free boundary, it's equivalent to say, the kernel does not set for J one. So in this particular case, so that's to say, so alpha is between one and two in this range. Now the huge difference compared to the random diffusion problems, one and two I mentioned uh, earlier in the talk, is that in these models, accelerated spread never happens. So in these models three and four with the non-local diffusion, definitely accelerated spreading can happen and it depends on how you choose your kernel. And we know the threshold conditions on the kernel for this official KPP nonlinearity. Now, let's compare these two conditions, thin-tailed and J1. Well, thin-tailed implies J1, because if this is integrable, you multiply by X, well, that's integrable is this e to the lambda x lambda positive for some lambda positive. But of course, this does not imply that. For example, these ones here. So, so all these are not known, uh, not thin tailed. So now basically uh, this condition means so accelerated spreading happens less often in the free boundary model than the one without a free boundary. And actually, I mean, it happens. So here we, at least for, well, for these kind of kernels, there's no exponential uh, growth of the front. So only uh, like a power of T. But in the Low, uh, in the non-local diffusion problem with, without a free bound in three, uh, we know exponential growth can happen to the front. So finally, I, I just don't want to mention, because this is all very new, there are some uh, related works on free boundary problem with the non-local diffusion. Uh, some of these are uh, most of these are, I've not I've got a, a time to mention. So these are all uh, relatively new recent uh, joint work uh, that I uh, have involved in. They are apparently, uh, there are also uh, work by other people uh, I'm not that familiar with. I think I'll just uh, stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank Professor Du for his uh, very interesting talk and very nice talk. Any questions and comments? If you have any questions, you can uh, write in the chat, chat form. You can put uh, your questions in the chat. I ask a question, Professor Du, mm -hmm. and uh, for the, uh, do the, does the dimension affect the, your result? You do some equations in one dimension, and if in higher yeah. dimension. 
to a yes, that's a yeah that's a very good question we are uh, actually now working on the high dimension case with a uh, radio symmetry the uh -huh. easy high dimension case uh, but uh -huh. unlike the local diffusion case uh, even with the radio symmetry uh, the mm -hmm. extension is uh, uh, less easy compared to the local diffusion case yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, we are working on that right now. Yeah. I'm working oh, okay, okay. on that with uh, Wen Jie Ni. And, uh, uh, I, I, we are, are rather positive. So I think uh, we are able to extend uh, the results to the high dimension case, of course, mm -hmm. with uh, modifications. At yeah, least. Yeah. Now you do, you do on radio case. Now, now you do on radio case, maybe. Just the yeah, we start with the radio case. We need to get a feeling to say yes, uh, yeah, what yeah, kind yeah. of a, a result modifications is needed. And then uh, eventually we want to look at the non radio case. Yes, 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 yes. It's a very interesting topic. <laughs> yes, very. Yes, yes. And any questions? What the? And another question I, I asked. If there is a mu, the content the mu at the yes. uh, for the first model. What's the what the meaning about this? This uh, is uh, uh, for the first model. You have a content the mu. Yes. The, if we yeah. now, uh, so if we assume there's a population loss of a k unit mm -hmm. per unit of volume at the front. Mm -hmm. And then mu would be the diffusion rate d over k. Oh. So of course this is uh, if we make this assumption, <laughs> oh. we are uh, we can find a meaning of mu. Oh. Yeah. So unfortunately, for these for biological problems, very often uh, there's no uh, guiding principle to help you with the modeling. You mm -hmm. you try to make a, a reasonable assumption, and then you work with your model and say whether the model, the phenomenon you derive from the model, makes a sense. Uh, then, uh, yeah, yeah. Over k. Yeah, yeah. So, so the new is d d is oh, this this is a a separating content, separating content, and k is. So, okay. so D is from here, and K is from uh, assumption. Yeah. Oh, oh so, so. Yeah. <coughs> yes. yes. Okay. Very easy. Uh, so, I, I have some questions. Okay. Hello, Joanne. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Professor Chu, uh, nice to meet you here. <laughs> Professor Chang. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very nice talk. I learned a lot. Uh, so, uh, Give me uh, many informations. Uh, so I probably want to ask a question. Uh, um, this uh, this uh, result are very nice for uh, from uh, local to non-local uh, for the single equations. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, uh, is there some results for uh, for like two species? That have, uh, yeah, no yeah. matter is a competition or co. Uh, corporations. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, yes, we did, uh, so some of the work here uh, okay. are for systems. So this one with the wind gear mm -hmm. has just appeared. Uh, this is for a two species model with a mm -hmm. non-local diffusion and a free boundary. And oh, so this, uh, so this is for a two species uh, competition model. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. These are uh, all for uh, two species, yeah. So, so, uh, so uh, because the, I, I couldn't see this uh, result in this paper, I just wonder uh, if there are difference between single species and two species, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, from yeah. the mathematical point of view, uh, the result. Uh, yeah, definitely there should be uh, many differences. And okay. for the moment, uh, the system we worked on mostly behave like the Fisher KPP. <laughs> okay. For this one, uh, mm -hmm. this one is a competition system. We cons 
uh, we looked at a weak competition, uh, weak predator prey, they behave uh, rather differently. However, uh, our results on these kind of uh, models are less complete. Okay. So for these models, so these ones, the, the epidemic models and these uh, uh, West Nile virus model, they basically uh, behave like a monostable model. For these kind of models, we actually, we are able to obtain uh, most of the results are mentioned tonight for these uh, single species. Of course, uh, it's complicated. Okay. But for, so, uh, for, for systems, actually we worked on N, uh, N equations system, but as long as they is a cooperative, they behave like a monostable, okay. you know, we can prove similar results. Okay, thank you. Uh, very interesting. I have a look at this uh, uh, preprints on the uh, archive. Uh, thank you. I really want to learn something from there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Du. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Professor Du. And uh, thank you all. And uh, any questions or comments? If there is uh, no, we thank Professor Du again and uh, for his uh, very nice talk and uh, very interesting topic. Okay. Uh, oh, that's a, uh, huh, you, you show a professor, a doctor, then you, you, uh, you said something. Thank you. It's uh, really nice to uh, talk to people through this new medium. <laughs> so we, uh, we can communicate uh, across yeah. the ocean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> different time zones. Yes. 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 Oh. Oh. Thanks a lot, also to to both of you, uh, to all of you for joining, and to, especially for P Professor Du, of course, for uh, the very nice talk. I think there's there's one more question actually in the chat. Let me see. Uh, there was a question: if there's any work related to stochastic dynamics in your work, or if there's any relation, I guess, to sto stochastic dynamics in your work. Yeah, uh, so uh, for these models, uh, uh, definitely uh, stochastic models are very, very meaningful. But unfortunately, I've not worked in that direction. I'm pretty sure uh, there, there are uh, relations to stochastic models, which are very, very meaningful, especially for problems arising in biology. So these are spreading things. And actually, uh, some some of the, some of these uh, uh, classical results I, I I didn't get time to mention in this direction for the local diffusions uh, the uh, local diffusion model the classical model some of these uh, classical results were first approved by probabilistic method and analytical method only uh, came later. Yes, no, I also don't see any, any questions anymore. So thanks a lot again uh, to everybody who joined, to Professor Du. Um, so I hope to see many of you again in the coming weeks. Next week, uh, we have a talk. It's related to deep learning and PDEs, uh, always a popular modern topic. So I hope to see many of you again, same time, same place. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank